Kia ora, welcome to Parliament TV. Over the next hour, we present items from the TVNZ collection, from archives held by Nga Taonga Sound and Vision, to remember the politics from our past. Bill Rowling took over the leadership of the Labour Party following the death of Norman Kirk in 1974 and became Prime Minister. Labour lost the 1975 general election to the National Party, led by Robert Muldoon. A year later, Rowling was interviewed by Brian Edwards for the Edwards on Saturday series. It's exactly one year, almost to the day, since you, the voters, rejected Bill Rowling and the Labour Party in favour of New Zealand the way you wanted it. And that means it's exactly one year to the day, almost, that Bill Rowling has been the leader of the opposition. On this programme tonight, we're going to examine his record in office with the man himself. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Rowling. I want to begin by explaining that in researching this program, we didn't talk, as we usually do in these situations, to your political enemies. We talked only to your political friends. We talked to Labour MPs, former Labour MPs. We talked to left-wing political scientists. We talked to independent journalists and so on. So the questions in this interview reflect the views, not of your enemies, but of your friends as we talk to them. And I'd like to begin by asking you how satisfied you are with the opposition's record in office in this first year. Well, first let me say I'm delighted that you're able to uh, select who are my political enemies and who are my political friends. I thought perhaps I would be in the best position to do that, but uh, I note with interest how you've actually researched this program. As far as the year's concerned, uh, I think the bare, fairest basis of comparison is to look at the performance of the National Party in 1973 and compare that with Labour in 1976. In that respect, we've done extremely well. In fact, in some areas, the result has been quite spectacular. But from my point of view, there are quite a number of areas where clearly we've got in, to do what, much better. In what areas have the results been quite spectacular, as you put Well, I think the most important of these, quite frankly, is the way in which we have put together the, the party. For example, at the moment, the membership of the New Zealand Labour Party is at the highest level in the entire history of the party. And that's from a very low ebb at the time of the last general election. But as far as the general public are concerned, that's an invisible thing. Now, you use the term quite spectacular. Now, in terms of what the public can see, what have you done as opposition that has been quite spectacular? Well, let's just talk about the things that you asked me to talk right. about for a start, and then we can come to your question in a moment or two. And I wanted to make the point that uh, it's not what the public sees at the moment that's important. It's how the party is building its foundation, where the grassroots actually withered away. They are now being well and truly restored. Mm. The finances of the Labour Party are being put back into the kind of shape that we should have had, certainly before the last election and perhaps even many years ago. The and policy committee of the party has changed. The teams of people that we need to help us and the press and other areas are gradually being put together in, again, the way that we ought to have done earlier, but it wasn't done. So the achievements that you see, the major achievements, are really matters of organisation. Important nonetheless, but matters of organisation. Not, not just important, absolutely essential. And I set myself a target the night after the general election in 1975 and sort of gave a vow right then and there that never again would the Labour Party face a general election, having neglected our own people to the extent that we had. And how well do you think you have done personally as the leader of the opposition in this last year? I think I've continued to make ground. I think perhaps the best answer to that is the fact that uh, on Monday night, the actual anniversary by date of the general election, I had hoped to appear on television with the present Prime Minister to discuss the economy. The present Prime Minister has declined to appear with me on television for that purpose. What do you take that as meaning? I take that as meaning that the Prime Minister now finds that if you haven't got many feathers, it's not worth trying to fly. <laughs> Could I put a much more negative interpretation on it than that? And that is that Mr Muldoon just doesn't consider it worthwhile and that he's demonstrating publicly in this instance the contempt for you that he seems to demonstrate in the House. You'd be joking. The Prime Minister never, as the leader of the opposition or as Prime Minister before, has turned down any kind of opportunity for publicity under any circumstances, good, bad or indifferent. 
He's always grabbed the opportunity. This time he's not so keen and the reason is patently obvious. He'd be on the wrong end. Well, that happens to be my next question. How well do you think you have shaped up to Mr Muldoon in the House? And well, in I, public generally over the last year. I haven't certainly done the things that, uh, that he's done and I don't aspire to do uh, many of them. What do you mean by that? I mean some of the, the kind of comments that we've had inside Parliament and outside of it uh, when someone stands up uh, and dares to criticise uh, or even to question government, then they are promptly slapped down, they're saboteurs, they're nitpickers, they're smart alex, they're even traitors. If you're a journalist, you might well be a liar. Uh, that's not the field that I see politics In that last in. instance, the journalist was a liar. There was, well, there was, as I recall it, rather more than one occasion. Yes. Uh, I'll admit that the journalist jumped the gun, and I'll admit he put a little more faith in the, uh, the strength of the politicians well, who he... fed him the story in the first place <laughs> and thought they'd stand up to the Prime Minister. Well, he, apparently he, they didn't. No, he wrote the review before the show had taken place, didn't he? Yes, Which well, strikes me as journalistically fairly unacceptable, and the Prime Minister was entitled to criticise him for that, surely. Yes, I, I don't uh, blame the Prime Minister, Prime Minister for the odd sort of criticism, and if there are occasions when that's justified, let it so be. But there has been just a little too much, I think, for anyone to regard this as the as the norm or the acceptable. And politics is becoming the exception rather than the rule in Parliament. And I think all people are getting a bit fed up with that. So you think that the opposition's done fairly well as an opposition, and you think, in all modesty, that you've done fairly well as leader of the opposition. I began by saying that we talked only to people who ought to be, because of their positions, your political friends. And I'm afraid that None of them thought that you had done well in opposition. None of them thought that you had been effective. None of them thought the party had been effective. And none of them thought that the party had shown itself as a viable alternative to the present government. Yeah, well, of course, the Why fact... Why is that? The fact that you say none, I think, destroys your argument absolutely and perhaps makes a little more pertinent the observation that I made earlier that it was interesting that you chose who would be my political friends when you actually carried out the interviews. If there was uh, an element of criticism, that would be perfectly understandable because I think so many of our people are fed up with the present government that they are staggered that we're not able to do something to empty them out even though they've only been there a year and they feel frustrated and when they feel frustrated they probably vent some of their anger on the opposition and so you there don't... are areas where perhaps we haven't appeared as strong as we ought but I remind you that again compared with a, a very similar sized opposition in 1973 it's been a much stronger, much more coherent opposition with a real sense of direction. You haven't encountered a sense of disappointment among your own supporters at your performance over the last year. I think early in the piece there was a great deal of disappointment about the loss of the election. And uh, people apportion blame as they will. But the more interesting thing to reflect on is not what happened then, because it's no use sitting down and baying at the moon about the past. But what's happening now and where we appear to be going in the future? And over the last several months, many months, I've been holding rallies around the country. I think 56 or 57 I've had now. And the interesting thing about those rallies is each one of them grows in strength, in numerical strength, and in the liveliness and determination of the people there. And I've had a number of meetings, even in the last two or three weeks, where the crowd was infinitely larger than the crowd I was able to draw at the time of the general election, right in the heat of a campaign. One of the commonest criticisms that were made by the people we talked to was that the opposition existed only by reference to the Prime Minister, that the opposition was hypnotised by the Prime Minister, that the only unity that there was in the opposition lay in its hatred for the Prime Minister. Is there any truth in that, do you think? I think hatred's perhaps a bit strong as far as concerned. I think there's a fair number of us that... Uh, don't have much use for the Prime Minister, and despise would not be too strong a word in a number of the circumstances. But that's a little different, I think, to hatred. But and we have, uh, we, by the Prime we have, we have, no, no, not never hypnotised. Never hypnotised. Uh, in fact, uh, come to think of it, uh, one doesn't see him around Parliament the, much these days, so it'd have to be a pretty long-term hypnosis to last. <laughs> um, we uh, get together as a team, and we bind as a team, and we'll work as a team, and build as a team. I remember some years ago, I'm not, I can't quite remember now who it was, Harry Lapwood or someone like that, saying... Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tower of strength. Uh, yeah. a, name, <laughs> a name to conjure with. This wasn't one of my friends that you... No, no, no. <laughs> I 
I think he said some, something to the effect, every time the leader of the opposition, which was then Mr. Muldoon, gets to his feet, the opposition goes into a, uh, the government goes into a cold sweat. And this is what these people were saying, that really the whole direction of the Labour Party at the moment is against this man, instead of into the positive direction of policy and reconstruction. And I think there's an element of truth in that. Mm, you may do, and I can't stop you thinking that. But uh, I think that, uh, I think, you see, too, which is something different, that what is being done now in positive work, in reaching out to people in the party, because the policy of the party must be the product of the party, not just two or three people in Wellington, not the so-called hierarchy of the party, but the people within the party at large. And that, really, that restoration job that I was talking about earlier is now beginning to take its effect. And I'm certain that when we go to the next election, be it 78 or before, if it so happens, that we'll be able to take a very positive and I think somewhat radical, in fact, I don't think I know somewhat radical policy to the people of New Zealand. And Lord knows we need it. I was one of the many New Zealanders who felt very strongly indeed about nuclear ships coming into the harbour. Uh, and there were uh, a number of people in Wellington who were keen to take out protest shots and do something about it. But, you know, we really had to go and plead with the Labour Party to get a representative there. I would have thought that the Labour Party, if it felt strongly on this issue, would have been offering people left, right and centre, but it wasn't. It was another area where the opposition was largely invisible and had to be pushed into taking some sort of public action. No, well, not pushed to take public action again. Uh, two separate bills again. I know, I know it's coming back to Parliament, but again it is their area of operation, at least initially. They must align themselves with, with public action. That I, that I grant you. And I'm, I'm a little surprised and perhaps even a little distressed that not enough um, active support was made, though I do know of um, Colin Moyle, for example, mm. uh, was out in the harbour with one of the, one of the Wellington yachts. And certainly my former colleague, colleague Phil Amos, has been very much in the news yes. for his stand on the issue, and we all support what he's done. Unfortunately, uh, the public seems to share the viewpoint of the people we talk to, of the Leader of the Opposition as the Invisible Man. And you'll know uh, that by September, only 39% of the population, as shown in the opinion polls, Halen opinion polls, were satisfied with you as the Leader of the Opposition. Mm. And more seriously, it seems to me, only 56%, just over half of the people who voted for you in 1975, were satisfied with you as leader of the opposition. Let, I would have thought that was a pretty massive <coughs> vote of no confidence, really. Well, no, it's not. But that 39%, I'm bound to say, upsets me a little bit because I can't help but recall that it's not 39% of the population, but it's 39% of the eligible voters that put that present government where it is now. Right. So 39% apparently can be quite a significant figure in some respects. I, I again... Yes, but let's, no, not, no, let's not juggle with figures. Just over half of the people who voted for you, who were on your side in 1975, just over half, are satisfied with your performance as leader of the opposition. That's a pretty widespread disillusionment in a year, isn't it? No, I think what will be important is what happens from here on in. And I hope that I get a chance to talk with you or to someone else on television about this time next year, perhaps a little bit earlier. I think a lot of Labour people are frustrated. And most of them have a particular cause, and because that cause is not being carried forward by the present administration, and they don't see that particular cause being attacked sufficiently strongly by a Labour movement, uh, then they, they get a little discouraged. We've got to make it plain to them that their cause is not lost sight of, that it will come back as part of a coherent policy. And uh, while it's true, people uh, in the Hayland poll express dissatisfaction in general terms, I find that... Uh, the same number uh, expressed dissatisfaction with the Prime Minister. It'll be a little bit more, I guess, when the next poll or two come out. And there are other features. Um, I think Mr Dryden, didn't he? Isn't he? He runs a sort of an opposition show to you, um, <laughs> one of the others. He had some Halen poll figures um, just last week when he talked about some of the characteristics of politicians that uh, he'd got people to vote on. And I think in things like, like honesty, understanding, ability to lead a team that his poll showed that I was so far ahead of the present Prime Minister I couldn't even wave out to That's him. right, but honestly... <laughs> the 
The name of the game, unfortunately, is winning, and honesty and ability to lead a team and all those other things don't seem to be winning characteristics, do they? They're going to be. You see, the thing about this... Uh, the thing about the, the poll is that, that interests me is, as I said, that only 56% of people who voted for you in 75 are satisfied with you. 83% of people who voted for Rob Muldoon in 1975 are satisfied with him. Is that right? Yes. Mm. I wonder how, what if they are at the moment. Do you think they would be still? They seem to be. I, 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 talking of polls, I, I am reminded of a figure that keeps cropping up of a poll that was taken in 1972. And one of the questions that was put out at that time was, who do you regard as the, sort of the, forget the exact wording of it, it was more or less the dominant political figure of the time. The most effective politician. Mm, most, that's right, the most effective politician. Norman Kirk scored 9%. And it wasn't many months later that he was the Prime Minister of this country and recognised within a month or two after that as one of the finest Prime Ministers that we've ever seen. Right, I wouldn't well, get too carried away with polls at this stage of well, things. Well, I would take note of them, at least. We'll be back again in two minutes. If you were... Uh, rating in the polls continued to drop as it has been doing, would you consider resigning as leader of the party? Well, it won't. So I don't have to worry about it. Well, that really isn't the answer to the question. If it did, would you consider resigning? Well, I, re I, know, I just regard the, the question as a bit of a nonsense. Um, and I'm certainly not... Continued. Why should it be a bit of a nonsense? Uh, well, not since, since February, it has continued to drop. Why should it be a nonsense to suggest it will continue to drop? Well, it could go a little bit. That wouldn't... Yeah. Uh, wouldn't uh, well, it would, I suppose, disturb me a little. But, yeah. uh, no, I've got no intention of resigning. I have every intention of leading the Labour Party back to victory. And, uh, that's, that's really the task that the Labour Party gave me. I find it kind of interesting, you know, the National Party have always been very good at getting stories going that tend to undermine the leader of the Labour Party. It's about as old as the National Party itself. It's the oldest trick in the book. And they've always had a, a moderate measure of success. I remember the stories that used to float around about Norman Kirk. They used to call him a great fat slob. And I heard it echoed in her own ranks. And then when I came along, there was a mistaken view that if you weren't arrogant, then you weren't strong. Yet those who have been closest to me throughout my political career decided, first of all, I'd be a vice president of the party, then I'd be a president unopposed for three years, then I would be a cabinet minister, and then I would lead the party. And they didn't do that because I lacked decision. And they didn't do that because they thought I lacked leadership. But the single most common thing that was said about you by the people that we talked to was that you were, and I quote, just too nice to be prime minister. Too nice to be leader of the opposition. Uh, and I think there's substance in what they said, that your image as Mr. Nice is the one thing that slowly but surely is destroying you because it's the wrong image for the times. People don't want a Mr. Nice. They want a Mr. Strong. And that's not you as people see you. Well, I can't... Uh, my colleagues obviously don't agree with that as far as the strength is concerned. But the other thing is that, uh, the word nice I, grates on me too. Yeah. Decent, one thing. Uh, a nice is one thing. Decent, I think, they want. They want decency and they want strength. And we'll give them both of those. But do you agree... Uh, I might just ask your supporters to contain their enthusiasm or we'll never get through the interview. Do you agree that this nice image is doing you damage now? I think um, the fact that they were able to sort of play up the nice but uh, wishy-washy, and when I say they, I'm talking about my political opponents, not my political friends mm. that you refer to at the time of the last general election, was a damaging situation. And that's something that uh, obviously has got to be overcome. And I've got to get about and about and among people and let them see and understand me as I am and let them understand also from my colleagues that when decisions are required, I can make those decisions in the interest of the country, no matter how difficult they might be. You see, it seems to me that you've been fairly unlucky, in a sense, in what you might call the comparison stakes. Uh, when you were Prime Minister, you had to cope with the image of a political superman, Norman Kirk, who had gone before you. And now that you're leader of the opposition, you're again having to cope with the image of a man that some people see as a political superman. Wouldn't life have been easier for you if the man on the other side of the fence had been Jack Marshall or even Keith Elliott? 
I think politics must, would have been much more pleasant. <laughs> and I think the result would probably have been, well, I'm sure it would have been better in the interest of New Zealand. There would have been much less of the division, the confrontation, the diversion that we see at the present time. Mm. But as far as uh, I personally concerned, I'm not so sure that you're, you're right. In fact, I think history may well prove that you are wrong. What happens in the short term? But didn't you feel work out too well in the long? Didn't you feel politically dwarfed by, by Norman Kirk? And don't you, to some extent, feel politically dwarfed by Rob Muldoon, who, whatever his faults, is the master self-publicist, which you clearly aren't? I certainly looked up to Norman Kirk as a man, as a politician. And uh, while he was there, the thoughts of leadership were some, they were completely foreign to me. And I suddenly found myself in a situation which, quite frankly, I had not expected. And in some ways, looking back on it, it was a situation for which I was ill prepared. You think he came too soon? I think so, Your yes. Your rise to the leadership came too soon. But uh, the circumstances are different now. Uh, the experience that I've had then and since will stand me in very good stead the next time round, and that won't be quite so far away. As far as feeling politically dwarfed by the present Prime Minister, no, I wouldn't concede that at all. Uh, Let me just I, I find him, in many, many respects, a political pygmy. <laughs> Why do you say that? What do you mean by that? I think that the, the, the kind of tactics that have to be resorted to in order to stay at the top in terms of the publicity that you speak to do not really fundamentally suggest a man of strength at all. If there was real political strength, then he'd be able to gain the publicity, be able to gain the support of the people and hold the support of the people without that kind of tactic. You see, I'm not entirely sure where your hopes lie because it seems to me that in, in November 1975, the choice was very clearly put before New Zealand between what Mr Muldoon represented, what people called strength, and what you represented fair-mindedness, reasonableness, uh, a conciliatory attitude, and so on. Uh, and people chose very clearly indeed for the assertiveness that Mr Muldoon represents. Now, I don't see any reason why that should change in the next two years. And I'm sure it must, because what has happened is that New Zealand has been very much brought now to the, to the political crossroads. And they've got to make up their minds, that is, the people of New Zealand, as to whether they turn right and go down a no-exit road that is repression, misery, every man for himself, the law of the jungle kind of situation. Or whether in fact we can't re-establish a, almost a new pioneering in politics because New Zealand is our pioneers. This country was established by people who protested. They protested against the circumstances in the United Kingdom particularly and they came to New Zealand and established a new society. And we've reached another period in our history where once again they will protest and they as pioneers will drive forward to a, a new plateau of social democracy. And that's the choice and that's the choice I'm certain they'll take. They will not go down that dead end road which they're being led at the present time yes, by this administration. But they knew exactly what they were getting. It seems to me Oh, that, no, they didn't. Well, I think they did. Do you remember all those commercials that the National Party put on in 1975? It seems to me they spelled out very clearly what they stood for and they've delivered what they stood for. And they like it if you go by the polls. I think that people were well and truly sucked in by those commercials because it wasn't what the National Party stood for, it was what they were claiming that other people would do with regard to what they alleged were the freedom of New Zealanders. Well, New Zealanders know well and truly what's happened to their freedom under this administration. Do you you know, the two fundamental concepts in the kind of democratic socialism in which the Labour Party believes are freedom and democracy. Do you intend to attempt to change your image? Do you intend to attempt to produce greater strength, greater decisiveness, all the things that your critics say you lack? Or do I you intend to stay just the same as I you certainly are? don't intend to change those characteristics you which don't. people obviously think are important. On the other hand, experience, quite apart from anything else, uh, and public platforms and other places, and the experience of opposition. We are uh, moving into an attack rather than a defence situation will change, I think, outwardly, at least, mm. my appearance to people. One interesting comment was made by several of the people we talked to, and that was that you lacked one element essential to success in politics, and that was the hunger for power and the hunger to win. You didn't seem to have it. That in some ways, being in politics to you was what you might call an alternative career. And without that lust to win and that lust for power, you could never succeed. 
Perhaps that's one place where my appetite has quickened a good deal by events over the last 12 months. And I am determined that the Labour Party will go back, and I'm going to lead them back. Do you hunger to be the Prime Minister? Yourself? That really follows. I, I do hunger for the Labour Party to be returned. No, that's not the decency. question. Do you want to be the Prime, Prime Minister? Minister? Do you want to be the Prime Minister? Yes, I do. You do. Did yes. you enjoy being the Prime Minister before? In many respects, yes. It was hard. It was hard on my family. It was hard on my wife. Yeah. But there are a lot of compensations in, in that job, in the people you meet and work with and the things yeah. that you feel you can do, yes. providing you're given enough time to do but it. But in a word, a you shorter. are ambitious to be the Prime Minister. Yes. You are. All right. Thank you very much. We'll be back again in about two minutes. One of the other things which was frequently said about you was that you're really too much of a safe player, not enough of a gambler to take the sort of risks that are probably necessary to get Labour back in the running. Do you agree with that? Don't seem to put think, much faith in, in gut responses and in, in intuition and taking a chance. I'm coming to that, but I had to learn a little, I think, the, the role of the leader of the opposition, which was a, a foreign role to me. I agree that you've got to react in a, in a gut fashion to many things, and uh, I'm a fast learner as far as that's concerned. I see. So you agree that you haven't done that in the past, but you're about to do it now. Well, I think I've started. No, I wouldn't say I haven't done it in the past, but perhaps not frequently enough. It's a pretty good example, and that's in uh, May, was it, of uh, 75, when I gather from Michael Bassett's book that a majority in caucus voted for a snap early election, mm -hmm. and you decided against it. No, well, you see, there's two or three things wrong with that. A caucus never, ever made a decision in 1975 or any other time since I've been in the Labour Party caucus with regard to a slap, snap election. And uh, if you've interpreted that from uh, Michael Bastard's book, uh, let me assure you there's no basis for your interpretation Well, what at all. was the story there? There was a feeling, wasn't there, in caucus, and perhaps among a majority of caucus, that it would be a good idea to have an early election. And that idea was canvassed, mm. and many supported it. It was canvassed among yes. some people. It certainly wasn't a majority view. I, that I'm pretty certain, and I, I only say I'm certain on listening around. The thing that uh, seemed to me to be the strongest uh, factor against going to the country at that time was that we had a majority of 23. Mm. That if we couldn't govern with a majority of 23, then uh, we weren't going to be expected to govern any, any, other, any other conditions. Although, um, in retrospect, possibly because of some changes in, in economic policy and so on, there might have been some justification. I felt, however, that uh, we were there to govern and uh, we should carry on. Would you have we been did. capable of taking a decision like that? Yes. You would. You would have had the courage to, to take I that did. sort of risk? Well, I took the decision. In that case, the decision was not to go ahead. As it turned out, the risk, the risk was waiting, not, yes. not going. Yes. Michael Bassett notes that he noted in his diary at the time, he who hesitates is lost. Mm -hmm. And yes. that he thought that that fitted you pretty well. Well, <laughs> well it's in his diary. Yes. And he was lost. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's somewhere, there, have been yes. others, there have been others that stood from parli Parliament from time to time, of course. Yes. Some of those have lost. Oh, indeed, yes, that's never right. Made it even. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> In some ways, uh, that remark is really more worthy of Mr. Muldoon than you, isn't it? <laughs> you, yes. I like to see people come back second time. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> In, in some ways, your career seems to parallel that, if you'll forgive me, of Jack Marshall. And I wondered whether already you were starting to feel any of the long knives from your own party. No. Not at all? No reason why I should. You don't think that there might be one or two rehearsing in the back room at the moment for the job? <laughs> it's a long way back if that's where they are. <laughs> it's a serious question. I'm not really sure no. I'm getting a serious answer. You're getting a serious answer. You're quite convinced that I do not in none any of way your party are quietly rehearsing I for do, the job in the back I room. I do not in any way feel threatened. Yes. Let me ask you a different question then. Do you perhaps not feel threatened because there is simply no one else in your party capable of assuming the role of leader? Well, there are people with the capacity, but they're going to have to wait a little while. Who are they? I think um, my deputy, a number of the senior blokes, and certainly some of those that are coming through and the younger members will have a, uh, a capacity to lead the party in due course. But at the moment, I am the leader of the party. Yes. I intend to stay there and lead them to victory in the election. When you, I would have thought your deputy had no support in those stakes. No, oh, no, you'll always have some support. You'll That's why support. he's the deputy leader of the party. He was elected to be the deputy Just leader. Just as an aside, 
One name frequently mentioned, of course, is that of Colin Moyle, as you know. Do you think his chances have been destroyed by recent events? No, not destroyed. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a very sad business. If mud is thrown in, it was thrown in an unconscionable way by the Prime Minister. Uh, I think some sort of damage is affected from it. I've known Colin Moyle as a friend, as a family man, as a colleague for more years than he and I have been in Parliament. And I think he's a very fine person in every way. And I just think it's a tremendous tragedy that parliamentary privilege can be used in the way that it was used on the night of the 4th of November. Has it ever occurred to you uh, that the intention of that event on the night of the 4th of November was, in fact, to destroy Colin Moyle's chances? If that was so, then what is already sinister is even more sinister. Mm. Um, looking at the Labour Party today, one wonders really where its base of support comes from now. Because it seems to me that you have the old, the dispossessed and the lonely uh, behind you, and I'm not sure who else. And I wonder where you see your future base of support coming from in New Zealand. Who are the people that you think you can best appeal to now? I think it'll be across the board. You mentioned the, the old, the lonely and the dispossessed. Mind you, if the present government keeps going the way it's going, there'll be a lot of those too, perhaps enough even to <laughs> ensure a government. But seriously, we are looking, obviously, for a, a wide-ranging support from the community as we have done for many, many years. Our basis of support has been, obviously, from the working people of New Zealand, and that always will be the case. I mentioned earlier well, I that... I wonder if that always will be the case. Uh, it was interesting that uh, we talked to a couple of trade unionists and their opinion, again, was that though you were a nice chap, you didn't really understand the trade union movement, you didn't feel comfortable with the trade union movement, and you couldn't be relied on to speak out on behalf of the trade union movement. And one person said to us, when did he publicly express support this year for any striking workers? Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd put the question to no, you. That's, that's a fair question, and the short, short, short answer to that is no. Who, who can express public support for a strike as such when you know that that's the last resort of those workers, that it's costing them? and their families a great deal. You say, hooray, they're on strike, what a fine thing. You know darn well it's not. You know that they have been driven into a corner. And that that, while it must remain the right of the working people of this country, is a condemnation of the economic and the industrial policies of the, of the government. Yes, if you forgive, now, that, forgive that's, me, that's a piece no, of sophistry. No, it no, is possible to say these people are on strike and we are sympathetic to them and we understand what they're doing and we support them in this action. Have you done that this year? We have said that we have understood completely the striking action of well, the, the, the freezing workers recently. Mm -hmm. Certainly before that, the, the, the people in which you are most closely involved, the broadcasters, though I must say on the second occasion, I felt the timing when a select committee was sitting was, was most inopportune. I didn't uh, rush my fences on that, but someone asked me a question directly. Do you think this is the time? Now, apparently, politicians are not supposed to speak out uh, with the truth, or at least that was the view of some people that I met on occasions like this. It was my view that it was most inopportune, and I said so plump and plain. Yes. I don't think didn't I'd be... Didn't me to everyone. No, indeed. I don't think I'd be revealing any secrets around here as to saying you were not the most popular man at Avalon by any means. And that seemed to be uh, quite a good area uh, where a group of people had taken industrial action to defend an organisation and set-up that you had created, and there you were, as near silent as made no difference. No. We were completely in accord with what they were trying to protect, and we have said so. We built it, mm. and we will certainly restore it if it's damaged by this government. But one thing that was absolutely necessary for the people in this area and others that work in that media was to ensure that they had the public going with them, not against them. Mm. And it seemed to me that it was a sadly mistimed move. I suppose the most significant thing that was said about you by the people that we talked to uh, and about the Labour Party was that there was now no political vision, no political philosophy of the sort that was visible in the 1930s in the Labour Party. Um, that the Labour Party knew where it had been but didn't know where it was going. And I'd like to ask you, what is that vision? What is that philosophy? Where are you going now? What do you offer? Well, you remember I mentioned earlier when I was talking to you this question of the two roads. That New Zealand is at the crossroads and that I think they must move and will move towards a new plateau of what I call social democracy. What does that mean? What does it mean to me? It means that I want for other people's children, for other people's families, what I want for my own children. That means 
a division of the wealth of the country in the wider sense among all our people, not a widening of the gap as we're getting at the present time where the wealthier get more and the poorer people get less. And that division is made on the basis of effort and also on the basis of need. Those two things are fundamental. But it's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's for those children and my children, it's, it's opportunity in the wider sense. It's an environment in which they can be, live with, with pride and joy. It is accepting the responsibilities that they must accept. That is concern for other people. And these are the kind of things that I see on this, what I've termed a plateau of, of social democracy. And that's why I believe that we really are a new, a new threshold, a new pioneering threshold of New Zealand politics. It's only the Labour Party that can do that job. Bill Ronning, thank you very much indeed. That interview, which was abridged, was broadcast on the 27th of November, 1976. For years, politicians have debated the pros and cons of privately run prisons. This story was broadcast on the Frontline series in May, 1991. For rights reasons, some elements of the story have been removed. Putting criminals behind bars has traditionally been the job of the state, but it seems that the fashionable enthusiasm for privatisation is about to overtake the prison system. As everyone knows, the system here is hopelessly overloaded and outmoded. The cost to the government of bringing it up to scratch would be formidable. A frontline understands that one solution being seriously considered by the government is to sell off part of our penal institutions. The Australian company CCA, Corrections Corporation of Australia, is already in the forefront of those lobbying to design, build and staff our first private prison, a new remand centre in Auckland. This report from Terence Taylor. Twelve hundred miles and several light years away, Auckland's Mount Eden Jail. No tennis courts here. For some reason they've forgotten to put up the nets. No gymnasium either. In fact, barely room for push-ups. This is doing time the hard way. Here, porridge would probably be a welcome change from the handouts of luncheon meat and bread, washed down with tea in the dubious comfort of the inmate's cell. It's not just a question of taste and style. There's a more fundamental difference. Barallon is run by a private company for private profit. Mount Eden, like all of our prisons, is run by the state. The problem is, it's a state under siege. Despite constant building and upgrading work, our prisons are still full to overflowing. The Justice Department calls it a horror story. We have more prisoners per head in New Zealand than almost anywhere in the world, and the numbers are growing at a phenomenal rate. We now have more than 4,000 inmates, up from just 2,700 five years ago. The public budget is struggling to keep pace. So New Zealand is now looking for private capital. It's a rock-solid bet the government will soon call for tenders to build and run a private prison here. How do we know? Well, you only have to listen to government officials in charge of our penal system. Not long ago, they used to recoil in horror at the very idea of privatisation, or what they call contract management. Today, in their own bureaucratic way, they seem downright enthusiastic. We have the view now that in the, in the light of overseas experience, uh, contract management within the prison system brings benefits to the system, both for the state, uh, for the public at large, uh, and for inmates themselves who are in prison. The Justice Department used to worry that privatisation might return us to the days when jailers had to make a profit, with painful consequences. Some became entrepreneurs in charge of a cheap and compliant labour force. 
they had little incentive to release prisoners except to the gallows, where money could be made by charging the public to watch. Some private jailers simply cut back their costs to the point where their convicts starved. Would anything like this happen today if we privatised? Not long ago, the Justice Department would have said yes. I've changed my mind. By seeing overseas experience? By learning from overseas experience. Queensland? And, and, and Queensland is one. Burrellan? Burrellan, particularly, uh, where I've had the opportunity to visit. Lift up the bar as high as it'll go without breaking from the wrist and hold it. At Burrellan, there's no sign of starvation. The only pain is self-inflicted at the $100,000 gymnasium, known affectionately as Club Burrellan. The reason there's no cost-cutting, according to the prison's general manager, Brian Dixon, is that the state government keeps him on his toes through a programme of rigorous monitoring. We have a series of uh, objectives to meet in relation to our contracts, in relation to medical care, food services, recreation and educational programmes, and uh, if we fail to meet those objectives as per our contract and uh, as monitored by our contract manager, then, of course, we'd lose our contract. And our motto is excellence in corrections, and uh, we subscribe to that, and uh, we believe that that's the way that we will uh, be successful in this industry. Let it out, try to get your forehead down. And you can't get much more excellent than this, a former Canadian Olympic coach to arrange your personal aerobic fitness program. Try same thing and try not to let your head bounce, okay? Big what we're doing is we're measuring them for aerobic capacity. We do uh, fat calipers, we do girth measurements, test flexibility, abdominal strength, and we actually take dynamometer testing for strength in the arms, the wrist area, as well as front and back. It's a comprehensive test, and what we do is run this through a computer. Within 24 hours, we have results back to the fellows. We go over a full assessment with them, design a program that fits their needs, and actually just the program is followed, and we retest them every two months to see how they're going. The gym could be better. I'd like a sprung floor and we've got a concrete floor, but we're living with it. it looks a bit like a country club. It is not a country club uh, and it is not a five-star hotel. Uh, when people are locked away in their cell, uh, they're in a, in a, in a room uh, with their shower and toilet in that cell and they can't come out of that cell until they're unlocked. I don't think we do get that. I don't think we get that sort of thing occur to you in a, in a country club. You might think Brian Dixon would want to lock his prisoners up all day and in cells considerably more Spartan than this. Why bother with ensuite bathrooms? After all, the company gets paid a set amount, $8 million from the state government and only makes a profit by keeping costs below that. But ask the prisoners. They enjoy doing their bird at Burallan. They seem happy with the conditions and an astonishing number had a special reason to tell Television New Zealand all about it. So where are you from, Carl? Uh, Napier, New Zealand. And where are you from? Um, Wellington. Originally what? from the West Coast, Greenland. And uh, do you like it here? Yeah. Yeah, it's good here. What, in a prison? Yeah, yeah well, the, if you've got to be anywhere, I'd rather be in this prison anyway. You know, I've been to other, so I've been to the other prisons before, and oh, it's got nothing on here. The Kiwis at Burallan like it, and that includes the dozen or so New Zealand warders, among them Ike Robin. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think New Zealand uh, needs a prison like this? I think it'll be a good idea. All prisons were changed. Uh, I think um, we're still, a lot of people are still thinking back in the old days with the bread and water and the big whip. Um, this is modern times. Uh, everything should be changed. And uh, if New Zealand got a private prison? Oh, I'd be thinking harder whether they go back home and uh, work in the uh, private jail in New Zealand. Who would have thought it? A radical social experiment conducted by a private company in Australia's most reactionary and corrupt state. The state once ruled by New Zealand-born Joe Bielke-Peterson. It was so corrupt that the former prisons minister, Jeff Muntz, has just been sentenced to 16 months in prison. Muntz was joking about the ball and chain, but he wasn't far off the mark. Queensland's prisons used to be archaic. Among the worst, Boggo Road Jail. Five years ago, riots at Boggo Road led to an inquiry into widespread abuses in the state's prisons. And the inquiry led to the establishment of a new body to run the penal system, a sort of state-owned enterprise, the Corrective Services Commission, under a progressive new director, Keith Hamburger. The fact is, if you look back over 200 years of history, you'll say, see we've done a shocking job, as all the Royal Commissions and inquiries have shown, 
and we've got nothing to be proud of in our history of imprisonment in this country. And if a private sector person can come along and show us a better way, different work practices, a more humane approach, rehabilitative programs that work, well, why wouldn't we use them? It was Hamburger who brought in the giant multinational company CCA to run Barallan. He's so pleased with the result, he reckons we all should have one. Does New Zealand need a Barallan, do you think? I believe it does, and I'm not trying to tell New Zealand what to do, but I believe every state-run uh, uh, prison system needs some element of competition and it needs uh, the private sector to come in, not to run the whole system, but to provide a standard. New Zealand hasn't had major riots since Mount Eden was set alight more than a quarter of a century ago. But conditions in the old fortress are still grim. And they're most grim in the remand wing. No ensuite bathroom here. In fact, until a few months ago, they didn't even have flush toilets, just buckets. The inmates are stuck in their rooms for around 17 hours a day. The rest of the time, they're free to enjoy the somewhat less than expansive exercise yards. Nobody much likes it. The only people remotely enthusiastic are to be found among the warders. It's quite adequate, it does its job. A lot of people don't say so. A lot of people think it's a, a hellhole. Um, well, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but it is adequate. But how can this be adequate for a remand wing, for people who haven't been sentenced yet, who are presumed to be innocent? Almost three quarters of them won't actually get prison terms when they come to trial. Many who've been on the wrong side of these bars are convinced it's decidedly inadequate. Among them a man who's well acquainted with the conditions he's spent 17 of his last 35 years in jail, Henry Burgess. Apparently things have changed now and they've got flush toilets, they tell me, in the cells. But that's only a recent innovation, you know, that's pretty new. But when I was there we had uh, piss pots and usually you only had one piss pot to two men and you had to share that. And uh, believe you me, by unlock in the morning you're locked up at half past four in the afternoon and not unlocked till half past seven. Uh, believe you me, they, they were brimful and very stinky, very stinky and you never had the cleaning facilities to really clean them out, you know. God, it was, it was bloody terrible. It's not supposed to be easy though, is it? Well, the, uh, the point was that on remand, you've never been found guilty. Like, you go on remand, and in my case, I was always as guilty as sin, I'll admit that. But, uh, the, you know, the odd person would be found not guilty, and he was treated worse than a sentenced man. Justice Department officials don't dispute many of the criticisms. The remand facilities at Mount Eden are not adequate. Uh, I'd hesitate to say that they don't measure up to international standards, uh, particularly the United Nations standard minimum rules for the uh, provision of facilities in prisons, but they certainly are just on the verge of it. In fact, the international standards are broken. For example, one United Nations rule reads, Remand inmates should always be separated from sentenced prisoners. In Mount Eden, that sometimes doesn't happen. When the prison is chock full, remand inmates are shunted across into the section for sentenced criminals. Just another indication, according to old lags, that the mount isn't good enough. It's a very, very old prison, and um, Henry Lawson's old words keep coming back to me. He said, if the people knew what the warders know and feel as the prisoners feel, if the people knew they would storm their jails like they stormed the old Bastille. And that is a real old Bastille, that one. Now it seems the Bastille is about to be stormed. Frontline understands Mount Eden's remand wing is likely to be the first part of the system to be privatised, with a new remand centre to be built in Auckland. Justice Department officials want a new beginning. They want the same sort of fresh revolution that occurred at Barallan, because that's how the Queenslanders see it, as a revolution. What happened was that they brought in a completely new approach, uh, new work practices, new award, uh, new management team, uh, no links to our old system, which has its links right back to the penal colony, if you like. New awards and practices. What that meant was a new labour force drawn in from the security firm Wormalds. There were no jobs for warders contaminated by old ways of thinking. We made a deliberate and conscious uh, uh, strategy not to employ those people, not to have to overcome the negativity and uh, during our staff training. And then it was a, I must say now, after some 15, 16 months of operation, that it was a right decision. At Barallan, the warders are instructed to be positive and informal. 
to get on with the prisoners. Witness to the success of the strategy, one inmate's affectionate portrait of his captor, former soldier Ike Robin. You see the inmates around here, they sort of smile and they talk to you. Uh, when you go to other correctional centres, they more or less ignore you and say, well, there goes another screw. Um, that's about it, you know. But the so-called screws from the Queensland state sector aren't quite so happy. When Baralan was set up, the old prison officers' union staged a protest at the state parliament. To them, the new contract labour force is an attack on union membership. And not surprisingly, their counterparts in New Zealand, the penal section of the PSA, have the same concerns. Oh, I'm sure the Department of Justice head office will take great delight in, in cracking the, uh, the penal division group of the Public Service Association. They, they, would, they would be falling over themselves to join the front of the queue for that one. The PSA believe the New Zealand state system is not only good enough, it's the only way. Up to now, the state alone has had the right to deprive citizens of their freedom. The union want to keep it that way. I think it's immoral that uh, Wormalds, CCA of America, a building company in Australia should make money out of misery. Do you think I, take, I take it you're a married man. I if am. your wife was, was viciously attacked and raped, you would like a security firm in New Zealand to make money out of that? I would have my doubts. I would have my doubts. Think about it. The argument against that in Queensland is that CCA don't make an obscene amount of money. They won the right to run Baralan by tendering a million dollars less than anyone else, including the state. So if they could do it more cheaply, why not let them? CCA in Australia say it's cheaper for them to run a prison than it is for the state. Well, I mean, that, that's a, a direct lie. To be fair, CCA no longer make that claim. This state prison, Wacol, they admit, now runs more cheaply than Baralan. Today, the evidence suggests private prisons aren't more cost-efficient, a point accepted by the New Zealand Justice Department. They are not cheaper. They are not cheaper. What they do do is provide the opportunity to introduce new ideas, uh, new approaches, unsullied, as it were, by many, many years of history of a particular way of doing things. One of Baralan's more spectacular new approaches, as you might expect from a private company, is to turn the jail into a hive of private enterprise and capitalism. Not only is there a shop selling various necessities to the inmates, there are also industries making products for the outside. Pot plants are sold by the thousand. The carpentry workshop turns out garden fences in competition with local producers. And beat this, an export industry. Prisoners in the metal workshop design utes for New Zealand. They have a contract to import larder nevers from the New Zealand Dairy Board, turn them into utilities and send them back to the Dairy Board. It's a new twist to the old argument that larders are made with slave labour. Here the inmates aren't slaves, but they get paid just $40 a week. It makes them rich compared with most jailbirds, but it's low enough for the prison panel beaters to be extremely competitive. Unfair competition or just astute business? Perhaps New Zealand needs a private prison to sew up similar deals. Well, I don't know that we've got notions to get into, uh, in, into the manufacture of vehicles, but we would certainly like some good ideas uh, about the sorts of industries that we could do uh, uh, in our prison system, particularly uh, import replacement activities. The New Zealand Justice Department seems determined to press on with privatisation. Mel Smith has visited Baralan and is quite open in his admiration. I was very impressed with Baralan, certainly was. I, uh, the management of Baralan uh, is, in my view, uh, a, a very good model for the proper management of a prison. CCA Chief Terry Lawson, in turn, has come to New Zealand to check out the national government. Well, I've been over to New Zealand twice now and uh, I've been delighted uh, at the, uh, the fairly quick reaction that we've, that's come out of the government there. I believe that, uh, that they see it as another alternative to their state system. I believe that we can save the New Zealand government and, of course, the New Zealand taxpayers' uh, money. They're quite interested, very interested? I would say that they're very interested. There's a suggestion that uh, a new remand centre will be built in Auckland. That has been discussed. Uh, and it has been discussed that uh, maybe that's the, the first facility that they look at privatising. You'd be happy to set up a new remand centre in Auckland? We would be delighted. 
Terry Lawson's CCA is gunning to be the first private prison company in New Zealand, and it aims to expand throughout Australia. The sales pitch is good, but isn't there a danger that we're all being conned by the pros from Australia? What if it's all show? As soon as they win a few more contracts, they won't need Burallan to look so good. Maybe then they'll cut costs and let it run down. Oh, no, no, no quite to the contrary. Uh, we, uh, we believe we'll get better. You don't think there's a danger that you and perhaps we all have been conned by a, a PR job? After all, they want to make the jail look like a model. They want to sell the idea to people like us. Surely, surely. Uh, and there's that danger, but uh, I hope uh, that, uh, being the hard-nosed bureaucrat that I am, uh, that I wouldn't be conned quite that easily. The New Zealand government may well be guided by its bureaucrats. After all, it's keen on privatisation of all sorts of things. But then the government also seems keen to be tough on crims. It'll be difficult to have it both ways, because CCA is wedded to the idea of gentle jails. We have this philosophy that uh, the, the better you treat prisoners, uh, you get it back. Uh, they treat you better. Whether it likes it or not, the New Zealand government may find itself conducting the same sort of radical reform as the Queenslanders. If we bring in the world's biggest and most experienced private prison company, CCA, there may be a loud clamour from our prison inmates wanting to be taken into the tender embrace of private enterprise. That report from Terence Taylor. Well, joining us now in the studio is the Minister of Justice, Doug Graham. Minister, can you confirm, first of all, that a new privately operated, privately run remand centre is to be built in Auckland quite soon? No, I can't confirm that, but I can confirm that we're certainly looking at that possibility. And uh, of the various alternatives, the remand block in Auckland strikes me as being the one that's most urgent. Would that be only a start? Would you then look at uh, privatisation for prisons, per se? I'm prepared to look at any improvement on what must be regarded as a pretty disastrous situation in New Zealand. And uh, I want to make it very clear that the government accepts the responsibility for all prisoners. So at the end of the day, my head's on the block. But yeah. how we do that is a different matter. Wouldn't you be forfeiting that responsibility and the traditional monopoly that the state has had over the maintenance of prisons? No, I don't think so. I think that we can make the rules very clear. They're expected to comply with the contracts, and as the Burallan man said, if they don't, they lose the contract. So I don't think that's a problem. So what's in it for the, the public? Well, hopefully, uh, there would be less reoffending from people who have been to one of those institutions. Our recidivism rate in New Zealand is very high. So that's one thing. One wonders, and though, it, if people wouldn't offend to get into those prisons. They look so comfortable. Uh, I don't think so, and it certainly wouldn't be my intention that they went to those prisons direct in any event. And, what, what do you mean? Well, I think that we have to recognise that, uh, that the prison has to be pretty tough at the beginning. But that one clearly wasn't. No, but you don't have to send them to that one at the beginning. We've got plenty of others which are not quite so uh, extravagant, one might say. So a stint in Mount Eden followed by a stint in Something Burrell like that is what jail. I have in mind, yes. Right. So what else is in it for the public, do you think? Apart from I, think it's, uh, I think it's cheaper. I think that uh, the inmates themselves are obviously more healthy. I think if you lock somebody up in concrete as we do for five years, they'll never be the same again. Uh, and uh, that just means they're going to reoffend and be uh, a burden on society from then on. I don't think anybody wins from that. The public want you to be tough, though, with prisoners, and that was part of your, your election platform. Yes, Can I you reconcile that with prisons of this nature? Yes, I think that uh, the people expect somebody who is sentenced to prison to undergo some pretty spartan conditions. I've got to say that having cited some of them in Mount Eden, and particularly in Dunedin, they are very Spartan. But I think that having uh, undergone a period there at the beginning of the sentence, then you've got to move them out. And I do not believe that people will respond and not re-offend if they never touch grass or see the sky or see trees. Now, would CCA be a shoo-in for the contract or would no, it be genuinely uh, up for grabs? It'll be up for grabs. Uh, I've been approached by a number of overseas uh, companies that are interested in building it. And I think we'd want to go slowly and, and take it step by step. But you can't lock up a remand prisoner who is deemed innocent for 17 or 18 hours a day. When will you make a decision about the remand? Towards the end of this year. Minister, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. The first privately run prison in New Zealand was the Auckland Central Remand Prison, which opened in the year 2000. For some contemporary insights into the workings of Parliament, 
you can view a collection of short videos from the Spotlight on Parliament series. Just head to the New Zealand Parliament website at www.parliament.nz.